Alrighty, so we're gonna go and get started. I do apologize. My neighbor just decided she was going to mow right now. So I hope that you're still able to hear me pretty well. <laughs> um, so hi everybody again, my name is Kristen. Um, I was on yesterday, but y'all didn't get to hear too much from me. Um, so I'm reintroducing myself. Um, and welcome to day two of camp. We're excited to have everybody back today. Um, and so first, if I can get my PowerPoint to work here. There we go, all right. So just as a reminder, go ahead and log into your One Health uh, account and pull up the cellular biology module um, so that you'll be prepared when we do it in just a bit. Um, Margaret, you could put that link in the chat. That would be great. You got it, dude. Hi, everybody. Hi, Margaret. Um, if you need any tech support, I'm your girl. She is the tech wizard, as we call her. So we're grateful to have her too. All right, so just to start everything off, we're gonna start with a recap from presentation one. Um, so yesterday we discussed cell theory as it pertains to cattle. And then we observed various unicellular and multicellular organisms capable of causing disease in cattle as these pathogens proliferate. So those pathogens we talked about yesterday were Trichomonas, fetus um, or trick, which is the reproductive disease. And then we talked about aspergillus. Um, so that's capable of causing mycotic disease. And remember mycotic means fungal. And then we talked about Clostridium chovii, aka black leg. Um, and that one's a bacteria that can cause sudden death in calves. All right, so here's our game plan for today. So we'll start by working through um, two sections today in our One Health module. That'll be cell types and then cell structures. And then once we've done that, um, we'll discuss how both prokaryotic and eukaryotic unicellular organisms can be beneficial to cattle. And we'll also examine uh, what can go wrong in cattle when these organisms are inappropriately eliminated due to a condition called acidosis. So that'll be really fun stuff when we get to it. Okay, guys. All right. So we're just going to jump right into it. Um, so I will exit out of this so I can show y'all how to get there. Let me see. Where to go? I had it. Here we go. Maybe. There we go. Okay. So, let's see. I'm just going to show it from the viewer perspective, and then Margaret will show it from the other registration perspective. Okay. So, when you log in and uh, click on the card, ecology module. Um, you did this first one yesterday. So that was the ecosystem. Um, I'm sorry, this is the wrong one. You're not doing ecology. I am so sorry. She's just know. testing you. She yeah. wants to see if you would notice. I am so sorry about that, guys. I'm still morning brain because that's what we did this morning. Um, so you will go to cellular biology. If it was any. And you're getting to this screen by registering. This is just us showing you what it looks like once you get there through your login. Okay, so cellular biology this time. Y'all did the cell theory yesterday. And so today you'll do the cell types and cell structures. Um, so I will check in with you guys about 15 minutes into it um, to see how we're doing, if we need more time. Um, so I'll give you until 125 and then I'll check back when, back in with you guys, okay? If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. I know we have at least one person that needs to do their pretest, so please, please make sure you do that before you start the other sections of today. I don't think it'll let you do the sections without doing your pretest, but if you're trying to access it and it won't let you, that's why. Make sure you do your pretest first. It's only 10 questions, so it shouldn't take too long, but no rush. 
we'll give everybody enough time to do what they need to do. Isabella, that's a really good question. Yes, ma'am. I'm putting together the recordings for the sessions of today and, and yesterday, and they should be ready and emailed out tomorrow. So you will get to rewatch the vet student portion that you're getting today. That way you won't feel like you missed out, okay? There he is. Yes. So, oh, okay, there we go. There's the camera. Oh. <laughs> Where are you going? Okay, so this is glitch. I just jumped really bad. <laughs> it scared me. Like, uh, like he was gonna fly through my computer screen and hit me. Like that would happen. It's three D. Yeah. So this is glitch. Um, he is a one-year-old crested gecko. We call him glitch because he likes to jump to like different places. He might do it for you guys. He didn't do it this morning. Maybe. He's really fascinated with my laptop screen. So he loves to jump up there. He's probably going to try it again. Maybe. Okay. He's so cute. <laughs> I just love his fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he scared love somebody else. <laughs> I have no idea what it is. You know, those terrible like pranks you play on people mm -hmm. where you ask them an email and then it scares them. Those yeah. get me every time. So that's probably what it is. <laughs> like you just want to make friends, huh? Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Are you going to go again? It's, it's funny. Not gonna, it's, go ahead. Sorry. It's not going to get me this time. <laughs> You're ready for it. I'm ready. Where are you going? I know you want to go over there so bad. I wish right, I could. I'm going to make our poll go live too. Guys, these questions are just for fun, just to give you something to do while we wait, okay? There. So when he sticks his tongue out, is he doing that for some sort of reason or just habit? Um. Well, I know so reptiles use that as a sensing mechanism to like sense the environment and um, it's kind of what's going on. So I feel like that's the same thing with him. I haven't actually like researched it, but it's just a hunch. That's what I was thinking because I know snakes do that and it's mm -hmm. kind of a way of, I guess, tasting the air to sense right. prey and other <laughs> stuff. Oh, this air is pretty tasty over here. I might go over there. <laughs> oh my gosh, these people are making me so happy with this poll. Oh, <laughs> with the water burger. Not water burger, Burger King. Burger King, yes. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> I think that's so interesting though that you grew up on Burger King like you didn't have really anything else. I think our high school group has more students from other states. Mm -hmm. Like Grace just put in the um, the notes. She doesn't even know what a burger is and I'm like see that's what? why I picked Burger King is because <laughs> I grew up with Burger King. When I was in Washington we didn't have Chick-fil-A. So when I, it's there now, but mm -hmm. when I was growing up, we didn't have it. And we moved to Texas and we said, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's my mowing again. The oh, weedy. Sounds, sounds like a good one. Yeah. Everybody this morning, I had leaf blowers. So it's, um, it's been a day of lawn care around here. <laughs> So Grace, Whataburger is basically a burger place um, that we have here in Texas. And they also have it in Oklahoma. 
I don't know where else it is though, but it's a, it's a Southern thing, I know. Yeah, it was formed in Cor Corpus Christi, right? I think so. Mm -hmm. Corpus Christi is where the first location started and a lot of Texans swear by it, but I think Burger King's fries and burgers are better. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll stick on my side of the fence. Yes, you should go if you ever travel to Texas. Like it is a part of visiting Texas, I think, is to eat Whataburger. But you can be a In-N-Out or Burger King girl in your heart like me. I actually never had In-N-Out because I already am like, I have to choose between. I usually only have the choice of Whataburger. But if there's a Burger King available, I'm like, yes. All right, I'm gonna go put him up so we can get going. Okay, it looks like everybody's voted in the poll. So we'll go through these um, awesome results while you put him up. <laughs> All right, say bye. Bye Glitch, bye. Thank you for the adrenaline rush of scaring me. <laughs> All right, so it looks like we have a pretty good spread out across um, what grade we're in. So that's pretty cool. Um, Whataburger did still by one vote win, um, but in our earlier uh, section, nobody voted for Burger King. So you three are just making my day. Thank you so much. Um, if you were turned into an animal, which would you want to be? Now it looks like bear one and bear is what I would pick too. Um, but I would be curious for somebody to defend which animal they chose and why. You can do it in the chat or you can unmute. Bears are cute and you like fish. They do eat fish, they eat salmon, you're right. I love that. I chose the bear because bears hibernate and that means they get to take naps. And when you're in college, you just miss the days when you had the time to take naps. I see your thumbs up page. I think you speak my language. You're like, yes, naps. Um, so that's why I picked bears. <laughs> um, and then, the last question, which is better? So this is also a Southern thing. Me, I was born in Texas, but I was raised in Washington and now I'm back in Texas. And so I don't get why people, that's okay. Thanks, thanks Paige. I don't understand why people get so bent out of shape about if there's beans or not in their chili, but some Southerners just get really upset if there's beans in their chili. So I thought that would be a good point of contention. And I fully respect the people that do not eat chili. That's okay, it's all good. <laughs> Thanks for playing with us, guys. I hope you liked meeting Glitch. Um, I'll let uh, Kristen share her screen again. Okie dokie. Can you see my screen? Yep. Very cute cow. Oh, thanks. He's a, he is very cute. Not my cow, though. All right. So. I hope everything went well during the modules. So now let's talk some more about cows. Okay, so I just wanted to share this cartoon with y'all. It'll make more sense in just a little bit, but it says it was hard enough making men ends meet when it was just the two of us. Now we have had a baby and suddenly there's four more stomachs to feed. So, <laughs> I'll let you ponder that for just a little bit and be like, okay, why, why are there four stomachs with the addition of a new baby? Okay, just think on that for a second. All right, so I gotta move y'all over here so I can see. Okay. All right, so now that you've done your modules, we're gonna take a deeper look at prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell types. And how do organisms of these varying cell types affect cattle? So to do this, it requires a basic understanding of the bovid gut. So remember yesterday we said bovid means cow, right? So the cow gut. All right, so here's where our four stomachs come in that we were talking about in the cartoon. So cows are termed ruminants. 
and that means that they have a four compartment stomach. So I'm going to show you all in this diagram before we move further. So the rumen is the first compartment right here. And then it travels along, goes to the reticulum. That's the second compartment. And then it goes to the omasum. We call this the onion. It literally looks like, um, like leaves of an onion or a book, as some people call it. And then it goes to the abomasum down here. And so those are the four compartments. So like I was saying, cattle have what is called a ruminant digestive system. They have four compartments. Maybe. Okay. So how does this relate to humans, you might ask? So people have what is referred to as a simple stomach. So meaning we, we only have one compartment. Um, so the compartments in the ruminant stomach are the rumen, reticulum, omasum, and abomasum. And for our purposes uh, today, we're only going to talk about the rumen. All right. So this picture over here is kind of what the rumen looks like. It looks like a little, like a bunch of little fingers, maybe. Yeah. So shag fingers. carpet. Shag carpet. Yeah, that's a great, great example. So the rumen is the largest stomach compartment. Um, I don't know if y'all saw in the diagram over here, but it's like all this over here goes up here, it's way up here. This thing is huge. Um, I wish I had an actual like plastinated model to show you because it really is huge. Um, and so moving on, so it can actually hold 25 gallons or more material, uh, depending on the size of the cow. That is a lot. Um, but aside from storage of um, liquid and feed and stuff, the rumen is also a fermentation vat. And so what that means is its environment uh, favors the growth of microbes. And these microbes digest or ferment um, feed particles uh, within the rumen to create volatile fatty acids. You may have heard of these already in your studies, um, but they're called VFAs. And so these volatile fatty acids are the cow's main energy source. And so um, these microbes also act as an important source of protein for the bovid. Okay, so the microbes within the rumen that create energy for the cow are both prokaryotic and eukaryotic. So some of the organisms we're gonna discuss include um, bacteria, which are classified as prokaryotes, or protozoa, which are classified as eukaryotes. All right, so this is going to be really cool. At least I really like it. Um, so we are going to look at this rumen fluid. So this, keep in mind, this is healthy rumen fluid. So we took a sample of fluid out of the rumen, put it under the microscope, and this is what you will see. So you can see all those little things moving around there. Um, they're kind of having like little traffic jams here and there <laughs> going all over the place. Um, so that is what a healthy rumen looks like. You got this big old guy here moving around. So keep that picture in mind as we move um, forward. So even though this may be a little gross, um, seeing a sample like this makes a veterinarian really happy. Um, why do y'all think this might make a veterinarian very happy? Put your guess in the chat. Diverse microbiome, yes, Dalton, great. Any other guesses? Means the room is healthy. Yes, ma'am. All right. Great job, guys. To allow proper digestion of plants. Awesome. Y'all are all on the perfect track, actually. Um, so yes, seeing a sample like that means that the rumen of this animal is functioning under appropriate conditions. It's very healthy. 
Whoops, I'm not gonna watch that again. Okay, so room and fluid gone wrong. So imagine you get a sample and it looks like, oh, no, why? Why are you doing this to me? You just pause the video of the other one. <laughs> if like this one won't work. I know. <laughs> He's like, okay, yay. Okay. Yay. So this is what um, unhealthy room and fluid looks like. There's not a whole lot going on here. Um, you don't see those big um, organisms moving around. There's no traffic jams happening. It just, it looks pretty dead, right? And so that is not what you want. So what would it look like under a microscope? So one common cause of death of microbes in the rumen is a condition called acidosis. We will get into that here next, maybe. Okay, so rumen acidosis. So just the term acidosis in general um, means that the environment is acidic, right? And so acidosis generally occurs when the pH of the rumen falls less than 5.5. Um, and this will be for an extended period of time uh, to create that acidic environment. And so when you're talking about normal room and pH, um, this is typically from 5.5 to 7. And uh, 7 is neutral, right? So then anything higher than that 7 will be basic, lower will be acidic. Um, and this is depending on the animal's normal diet. And the primary cause of this change in pH is feeding a high level of rapidly digestible carbohydrates, such as grains. And this causes two major events in the gut. So the first is the rumen can actually stop moving completely. Um, and this depresses the appetite um, and energy production. And then the other one is that the increased acidity changes the rumen microbes. Um, and this causes acid producing bacteria to take over. And then these bacteria produce more acid and actually make the acidosis worse because that pH is falling even more below 5.5. So some clinical signs here. So imagine you're a vet, you're looking at this cow, what might you see during rumen acidosis? So the prolonged drop in rumen pH will result in damage to the lining of the rumen and death of the protozoa, which are eukaryotes, and bacteria, um, which are prokaryotes, that aid in energy production for the bovid. So what you will see is a decreased feed intake because um, like we said, the appetite is depressed. Minimal rumination, so the process of chewing their cud uh, to break down uh, large feed particles um, doesn't happen as often increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate. And, and those two things together are because they have a decreased um, energy production. And so they don't have as much energy um, to kind of slow down everything and just live, right? They're working really hard just to stay alive. Diarrhea, this is because the lining of the rumen is damaged. So we have that GI, um, the GI system is pretty stressed. And so it'll cause a lot of diarrhea, lethargy. They just don't feel like doing much because they just don't have the energy. And then death, um, unfortunately, is also a clinical sign. <clears throat> and those who survive uh, rumen acidosis are likely to be poor doers as well. I know it's all very depressing, but we can treat it as doctors, we, as veterinarians. We do have a way to treat it to prevent it getting really bad before it gets to that point. So don't be too sad. <laughs> yeah, so like Margaret said, there are treatment options, uh, fortunately. Um, and so the key to treatment is restoring that balanced pH. So um, close to as between 5.5 and 7 as possible. Um, so the rumen does not involve, um, I'm sorry, I totally messed that up. 
So restoring a balanced pH to the room, it does not involve any specific treatment protocol. Um, but generally, uh, the conditions will return to normal a few days after the animal has been taken off of that high grain uh, feed. And then if caught early um, and the bovid is still standing, um, lavage, which I'll talk about that in just a second, um, is possible to empty the room in content. I think we have a picture of that on here. Yeah, okay. So this is the lavage treatment I was talking about. So basically they put a tube, I'm sorry, I'm pointing at the screen, you can't see. Um, so they take this tube, they put it down the cow's um, digestive tract, and then um, they put some liquid in it to flush out uh, the rumen and get that, all the yucky stuff out of there. And so beyond restoring the pH, uh, something we as veterinarians must be concerned with involves restoring um, all those microbes, and, um, eukaryotic and prokaryotic organisms back to the rumen, right? Because we don't have as many as we should um, during acidosis. So also remember that these um, organisms are essential in providing the bovid um, the needed energy to survive. We got to make those old towel fatty acids for the cow. Okay, so this process is actually really cool. Um, it is called rumen transplantation. Um, and it's actually called a fistulated or cannulated cow when they have this hole in the side of their body. Um, and the device in its side is called a cannula. So it has been surgically placed to allow us to safely access the contents of its rumen. Um, and this is because like, you don't want to have just a surgical hole into the rumen. You wanna have this device in there too, so that we can keep the rumen contents um, from spewing into the rest of the body um, and causing infection. And so because of this process, we're able to take some of the rumen fluid uh, from this healthy cow and then place it into our sick bovid that is just recovered uh, from acidosis to restore the microbes living in its gut. So because of the acidosis, we didn't have as many microbes um, in the fluid, right? And so we want to um, take the healthy microbes and put them in um, so that we can reestablish our colony. And so once these microbes are in the rumen again, um, they can begin producing needed energy for the bovid, uh, allowing it to make a full recovery. So see, not all microorganisms are bad. Some can be good. All right, so that was kind of fast today, but we do have Kahoot for you. Once again, so you can get your points for prizes. Okay. So since y'all can't be here in person, we thought it would be really cool to um, give you guys a virtual tour of the vet school. Um, and we tried to make it as interactive, like you were walking into the vet school. Um, so I hope you guys like the videos um, and some little things like that that we put in there. Um, so this is our day in the life of a vet student, um, PowerPoint. And so, I'm just going to start it off by saying um, this, I guess you could say is a Thursday, a typical Thursday um, of class. So as you can see, we have class all day long. So typically you have class, um, you have your like major classes in the morning and then you have your labs in the afternoon. Um, and so like you can see we had immunology at 8 a.m. Um, and then we have histology after that, um, which is the study of cells. So we look at a lot of um, images underneath microscopes and figure out uh, what structures um, are in different cell types and things like that. And then physiology lab. Um, so for physiology, we do things like looking at um, ECGs. So like how the heart is pumping blood through the body um, and then we have anatomy lab. Um, so we're looking at uh, cadavers of dogs mostly. 
Um, and so we learn like bone structure, where muscles are, um, nerves, arteries, pretty much any kind of structure that you can find on an animal, we learn about um, during, during our first uh, semester of vet school. And then in the fall, we typically, I mean, I'm sorry, in the spring, we typically have large animal anatomy. And so we learn about horses and uh, cattle. I think we have some goat uh, correlations in there as well. Some yeah, we, ruminants. yeah, at a at AM, and we work in groups on a horse and a goat, and then they supplement us with the cow. So nice, very nice. So Oklahoma State is just a little bit different. Um, we try to add some goat stuff in there. Um, and then integrated animal care lab. I will let Margaret talk about that. Yeah, so and when you get into your first year of vet school, they're teaching us all the things that are normal. So this is kind of like our primary care class of what's what's a normal vaccine schedule for your pets? What nutrition is correct for dogs versus cattle versus horses? How do you safely run cattle through a chute if you've never done that before? Um, if you aren't comfortable around horses, how do you handle horses safely, especially if they're sick and they're not feeling well? So it's a lot of the day-to-day -day things that a veterinarian will do all the time that they're making sure we have a good foundation in. So, um, Margaret, would you like to do this or do you wanna just switch back and forth? Oh, we can just switch back and forth. That sounds okay. good. That's great. Okay, I guess I'll go first. Yeah. Okay, all right, so. This is at the beginning of our day. When you first get there, um, you head into a classroom in Vinny. So we have three different buildings at the vet school. Um, we have Vinny, Vidi, and VG. It means I came, I saw, I conquered. So I think that's really cool. Um, it's kind of a little like motto kind of thing. Um, so a lot of the classrooms are in Vinny. Um, which is this first building here in the front. And then, so it's like one building and then the other two are kind of behind it, uh, right across from each other. So yeah, don't forget your morning coffee and breakfast because you're gonna need to stay awake for a long time. Um, but here's a little video for you guys. Make it full screen, maybe. Okay, let's see, sorry. There we go, maybe. So this is one of the main classrooms uh, that you would have classes in here in Quebec or in Vinny. Uh, so cool things about this, really large space, large classes, some classes here might be microbiology, genetics, things like that. We have cameras up there at the top so that all the lectures are recorded. In case you miss a day, you can come back and check it out. And then really cool thing, it's super important when you're in college, every seat has an outlet. Every seat has a plug, so important. <laughs> Yeah, so that's really cool, especially during um, COVID. We had a lot of online learning um, lectures and stuff. And so it was really nice to have everything recorded so you could either um, watch it live um, when it wasn't your week to be in person, or you could just go back, say you wanted to watch at eight o'clock at night um, and just catch up on everything. You could do that. So that was really nice. Or like if you're sick, you can just watch from your bed too. So this is an example of something that we would talk about in school. Um, and it kind of also touches nicely on our One Health concept of um, veterinarians have to be very aware of how diseases are transmitted between their animal patients and to humans from animal patients. And so we do activities in the classroom. This one, for example, is one about how disease is transmitted through handshaking, coughing, inanimate objects. So they probably use glow germ in this situation and put it on all of our hands and then had us touch a bunch of stuff and showed us where that transmission of disease could occur. Um, but another really good reminder on this slide is that um, our professor reminds us about Friday's test and testing is just a fact of life in vet school. We have typically a test every Monday and every Friday and sometimes two or three in the middle of the week as well, depending on what part of the semester we're in. 
So there's really never not a time you shouldn't be studying for something, but fortunately you are interested and you love what you're learning. So while it gets tiring to study that much, you still do like what you're learning and studying. So how to prepare for lectures. So as with any class in college, um, it is very important to be prepared just because I know it worked for me that I would read uh, the chapter beforehand, take some notes. So I kind of knew what we would be talking about in class. So that when I heard about it in class, um, it was like I was reviewing the material. So I was putting in actually less effort um, by doing the work beforehand than I would have sitting in class, hearing it for the first time, and then having to go back and be like, okay, I don't even know exactly what they were talking about here. Um, and so that's why lecture was very helpful to have after reviewing it or looking at the material for the first time because I had that second time to look over it. And it usually had more examples with it. And so I could put uh, the concepts uh, together more clearly. So some lectures just require more participation than others. Um, for example, in physiology and anatomy, um, we have these little, I wish I had mine to show you, but it's like this little clicker, like a remote looking thing um, that we have pop uh, quiz questions um, and bonus questions to answer. So the professor will just put a question up, question up on the uh, screen and you'll have to answer with your clicker uh, what you think it is. Some professors, they used it as bonus points um, and some just did it as participation like you were there for that day. And then some classes really require you to read before coming to class. Um, this one talks about agents of disease. Um, so like we had immunology where we studied about the immune system a lot. Um, and so we always had to read a chapter before going to class. And sometimes like you would put an article out um, that was something interesting or a change to a vaccination schedule. And so he would have us read that and it would also be on the test. Um, and so like in Agents of Disease, which was what we have um, today for our Thursday. Um, our professor expects us that we are familiar with terms like incubation period, enterotoxemia, and aspergillus. But you are you guys are already prepared somewhat because you know about aspergillus, right? You're already prepared. So hint, hint, these terms might be on your test this Friday, which if this were actually true, it would be on your test tomorrow, right? Because today is Thursday. Let's see. Oh, and some classes don't even require preparation at all. Um, just be ready to take notes and learn something new. So I'll let you, I guess, play the, the video, if you will, to show our oh, yeah. lab and then I can talk. This is the histology lab. As a first year, you get to learn how to identify all the different types of cells and tissues. As a second year, you'll have clinical pathology in here. What's cool about this lab is that we have microscopes with two sides to them, so you can look on with a partner at the same time. Also, the professor's microscope over there is connected to all the TVs in the room, so you can see what she's looking at and what she's talking about when she's trying to teach you. Also, what's cool is all the slides are online, so you can go home and study for histology. So histology is the study of anatomy at the cellular level. Um, and I really enjoyed it. It wasn't, a, it was only a one credit class in vet school, um, but I think it, it really teaches you a lot about what looks normal. And I guess the best example of why we need to know it is because if we remove cancer from the body, we have to submit that sample of tissue to a veterinary pathologist who will look at the tissues like this, like it looks here on the screen, um, like that one on the left, and they'll compare it to normal and go, this does not look normal, you're right, it was cancer. So that's why we study it is so that we know, at, even at the cellular level, what's normal for our patients. 
Um, that's large intestine on the left, and we're taught specifically how to identify large intestine versus small intestine at the cellular level, which is important for many, many reasons that I could nerd out about, but I'm not going to bore you with it today. Um, and then like, click, uh, like Kristen brought up, sometimes they use clicker questions to make sure that we've checked our, our knowledge and that we're keeping up okay with the material. All right, so next class is physiology. Watch our video. No, you're going to pay for me. Maybe. Here's our physiology cubicles. They're set up to be like exam rooms. In here, we found our skills on placing IV catheters, drawing blood for blood work, as well as administering IV drugs. It's a short video there, but those rooms are very nice. Um, I had the pleasure of working in them um, for physiology when I was an undergrad. Um, and it, it, they were just awesome. Great resource to have. Um, uh oh, you froze again. has a small group of dogs um, that vet students are able to practice their skills on um, throughout the semester. And then they're usually available for adoption. Um, and so the vet students um, usually end up adopting them whenever the program is done using them to help the students out. So yeah, so we're excited that Lucky will be ready for adoption uh, next spring. And Margaret, do you know how? Sorry, your question cut out. Do I know how what? I can't hear you. Oh. Sorry. You can't hear me. I know I saw you froze. I can hear you now. Okay. What did you hear last? I heard Margaret, do you know how? Oh, okay. So you didn't miss much. Okay. <laughs> I said, do you know how long the dogs are typically with the vet school? Uh, I would say about uh, three years oh, as yeah. typically adopted around then. But it depends okay. on if they turn out to be um, happy as a as a, a colony dog that's being used for teaching. Because mm -hmm. if they're not happy, then they will adopt them out sooner for the welfare of the dog to make sure they're happier. It also depends on if they're helping with another research study. So we ever heard of Labradors? heard a colony of Labradors that teaches as well. And I know one that was adopted as young as one years old because he just wasn't doing well as a colony dog and they knew he'd do better in a home. Oh, you're waiting on me. I was just making sure you heard me and you didn't go, oh no, you froze or anything. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna turn off my camera. Okay. It's having issues again. So yeah. I'll take, I can talk about lunch. That sounds great. Um, so one great thing about vet school is that you will always give you a one hour lunch break. And after four straight hours of lecture, you are so grateful that you can just eat your food. Um, but sometimes you can also use your lunch break to, to go running in the gym we have for vet students. You can go run home and let out your dog if you have it. I have two dogs here that I take care of. Um, or if you forgot your lunch, they have a really good cafe that has the best breakfast tacos. Um, and they have a marketplace for school supplies as well as shirt. Sorry. You're good. Go ahead. Okay. Ready? One of our biggest concerns as students is where are we going to get our next meal? At Invini, we have our own cafe that's open for breakfast and lunch. Also in Vinny, we have our own marketplace where we sell veterinary and biomedical science this year. So next time you're here with your family, stop at the marketplace to grab some meat, souvenirs, stuffed animals, and the other exciting things we have inside. This is my favorite part of the veterinary biomedical education complex. This courtyard is home to students all of the time, either relaxing, spending time outdoors, walking dogs, 
this is where a lot of people spend time, just getting some time outdoors, and we also have classes out here sometimes. Isn't it so pretty out here? I love it. Yeah, we love the courtyard. Um, we even have our own set of frisbees, football, soccer balls, so that if we have time because the class got out early, they encourage us to go play outside and not sit at a desk and continue to study so that we take good care of ourselves. Are you still there, Kristen? Hello. Can you hear me now? Yeah, whoa, that was trippy. Your old identity was still screen sharing even though you left the meeting. That's weird. So I just kicked your screen off and now I'll, I'll kick off now. Okay. I don't know why it's having such issues today. That was spooky. All right, let's try this again. Okay, I am going to turn my video off. So. All right, so this is a really cool um, thing that a and has. They're very lucky to have it because um, Oklahoma State at the moment does not have a clinical skills lab, but it is in the works. So maybe at least two, year, two years before I'm able to do this kind of thing. Um, and so they have this room called ACE. Clinical Skills Lab. And so I will play this video for you first before I talk about it. So right here you can see um, these are, oh, oops, it went away. Actually, I'm not sure what that is. It's Mark. a model for practicing uh, tying in an, uh, an abdominal drain or, I'll go back a, or a feeding tube. Okay. Cool. This lab is where we learn a lot of the, hey, I need you to go place an IV really fast. And now veterinary students can go, okay, I've done that before on a model. That way their first time placing an IV isn't um, in a live patient. And this uh, video is showing what it looks like to practice drawing blood from the tail of a cow um, because you have to palpate the correct anatomical landmark. So they're practicing doing that because they've made it out of a model to make it feel as real as possible. So that when they have to do it for real, they at least have something of confidence to go on. And then we have these farrier dummies to practice picking up a horse foot safely and correctly. And then to practice, this is called hoof testing to find sore spots on the hoof. If any of you guys have horses, you may have seen your vet do that before. And then I think one of the coolest thing we offer here at AM is ultrasound skills. So we have enough ultrasounds for us to work in small groups and practice diagnostic imaging before we hit the clinics in fourth year, which a lot of pro programs don't offer. Most veterinarians have to learn how to do ultrasound on the job after they graduate. All right, so. I'll go ahead and jump on this one. So next you're going to anatomy lab. So one of the things we have to do is wear a white lab coat, exam gloves, and grab our anatomy textbook. Um, so then, oh, Margaret, are you still, still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. Gotcha, okay. I wasn't sure if I froze again or not. No, no, you're good. Okay, cool. All right, so then we're gonna go into the anatomy lab where we will learn about bone structure. So 
Let's look at this video. Now we're in the anatomy lab, and it's exactly what it sounds like. As a first year vet student, you'll be spending a majority of your time in this lab. In the fall semester, you'll be learning a lot about the anatomy of a dog and comparing it to a cat. In the spring semester, you'll be learning about the anatomy of a horse, as well as food animals such as cattle, pigs, chickens, and goats. So short video there, but it's an amazing room as well. Um, we're typically in groups of like four students or so. Um, and then we have teaching assistants, which Margaret was for me. So that was very cool. Um, so they go around and help out the students. And like if we have a question of where a structure is, um, they can help us find it. And we have weekly quizzes usually just to kind of test our um, our knowledge to see where we're at. Um, at Oklahoma State, we would um, we would have group quizzes and sometimes we had individual quizzes. It just depended on the day. And then we had like um, like supplemental videos talking about like where we were supposed to give a certain injection before we talked about that muscle group or something like that. Um, it was actually one of my favorite classes just because it was so practical. Like, you know, you're going to use anatomy every day. Um, it's just a very essential part of your curriculum. So Margaret, this is a great slide for you. <laughs> yeah, um, so anatomy is my thing. I love it. Um, everybody seems to have like one feeling for anatomy of either loving it or disliking it strongly just because while it is fantastic and it does help you as a doctor, it's a lot of information. And so it can be kind of overwhelming. So um, come to class prepared is probably the best one. It's like, if you are supposed to read your dissection guide before you go to class, then you'll do much better if you go ahead and do that. Um, going to lab outside of class time is really important because then you have a chance to look at the structures on your own time using your own brain power and not relying just on the group mates that are around you while you're in your scheduled class. And then you're going to want to make a list of everything you're responsible for, which can be a very long list, but you wouldn't want to forget about a structure you were supposed to know for the exam and then it shows up on the test. And then you can study with a partner. Try it a couple of different ways though. Study with one person, study with a group of four, study on your own. Everybody's different. And so that's the number one thing I would say is try a couple of different things. Don't just try one thing and find out what actually does help you succeed. And another thing is as you progress through high school and even college, your method of studying is gonna change for success and that's okay. If you try to use the same method for studying, no matter what well, no matter what topic it is, no matter what class it is, then you might not do as well as if you were flexible in your thinking about how you can approach studying for a class. Okay, so now it's three o'clock, but we have another class to go to. So we're gonna go over to the integrated animal care lab. Again, I cannot, talk enough about Aiden's facilities. They have some of the best facilities in the nation, actually, as far as teaching goes. Um, and so sometimes you'll change into coveralls um, and boots and grab your stethoscope, thermometer and gloves, um, because they actually bring in cattle and horses into the vet school um, so that the students can practice um, their physical exams, um, doing palpations to feel reproductive tracts, um, different things like that. So I think um, that is, it's really an amazing room. Um, but I'll show you guys this video. Right now we're in our food animal lab. Our classes in here range from anywhere from learning how to perform a physical exam on cattle to learning how to safely operate and move them through a shoot system. We know not everybody has had experience working cattle, and that's okay. The lab from here can be anywhere between basic handling, keeping fishing, nerve block, palpation, or out here we practice our basic exam and moving them into a shoot system. This is the equine lab. This is one of the stocks where we can safely practice our equine clinical skills. Some of the labs that I've had so far include dental floating, reproductive ultrasound, and palpation. And some of the labs I've had include learning how to perform a physical exam, learning how to do a neuro exam, and learning some other reflexes on a horse. 
Just like when the doctor taps on your knee, we can learn a lot by doing a simple tap around the foot's thigh. Yeah, lots of cool different exams and procedures are done in uh, both the equine room there um, with the stocks and also um, outside in the shoots as well. And a and does have their own like herd of cattle and horses that they use um, and they keep them there at the vet school. Um, so we don't just bring in random animals, um, they stay there. Oops, so, sorry, Margaret. That's okay. So uh, you get to five and you go, woo, I'm done with class. <laughs> but unfortunately, like I mentioned earlier, you have many exams to study for. So first we say always take a break because if you don't take a break, then you'll burn out and then you won't do well because you won't have the energy or the drive to keep going, keep studying. So it's super important to take time to eat dinner, go walk your dog, go for a run if you want to. Watch your show that you've been waiting all day to watch and then set your own schedule for how you're going to study. Some people like to study at 5 a.m. Not me. I don't I don't play that game, but I respect those two. Um, some people like to study until 2 a.m. I used to be able to do that in undergrad. I can't do that anymore. And then some people study till 10. I study till 11, but that's because I gave myself a break of like two hours when I got home from school. So there's no wrong way to do it. Everybody's different. Um, and so again, try different methods. When you go to school, try studying or in the morning before class, try studying at night. And I'm sure you'll immediately have your, nope, this doesn't work for me like I've tried, like I've had when I tried other methods and that's okay. At least you tried. Yeah, so it's late at night, time to get some rest for another day of vet school. Um, and so you may think this sounds like a heavy schedule, which it is, it's a lot of work, um, but how can you prepare? So gain lots of animal experience. So I would recommend diversifying yourself as much as possible. I know we talked about this probably yesterday afternoon, um, but yeah, just do whatever um, makes you happiest too also. Cause like I had a whole bunch of small animal experience. And so I really wanted to check out large animals. And then I got to doing the large animals. I was like, oh, this is where I'm meant to be. Like, I love being in a barn. I love being out in pastures. Um, so just kind of find your, your niche and where you um, really enjoy spending your time. Learn how to manage your time. This was essential for me. Um, just because you have such a heavy schedule um, during the day, it's really easy to just sit down on the couch and watch like four hours of Netflix. Super easy. Um, but then you think, oh yeah, I have a test on Friday. So then you really just have to take it by chunks and say, I'm gonna study this much today, this much in the morning, and then whatever else I get done in between, that's gonna be good for me. Um, but you also have to put in time to take care of yourself, make sure you eat. I know a lot of people, they eat ramen. And so there's nothing wrong with ramen, but you do need to eat healthy um, so that your brain can function properly. And so that you also have enough energy to study for those late nights um, and be well prepared for those exams as well. I use a planner. Um, that's how I keep up with everything. Otherwise, I would forget when we had all of our quizzes and um, sometimes the dates would be off from the syllabus. And so it was just really nice to have everything down in one spot. Yeah, Margaret has excellent example there. Um, I could get mine out by the way. Um, so yeah, just planner is awesome for that school. And actually any type of college for it too. Yeah, that's beautiful, Margaret. It's color coded, don't okay. you? All the exams are in red. That's a lot of red. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, practice self discipline. Yes, this is very good. Like I said, binge watching Netflix. You just have to tell yourself, okay, 
I am going to study for two hours and then I will take a 15 or 10 minute break or whatever. And as Margaret was saying, you'll very quickly learn what works for you and what doesn't and what's most effective. Make a daily to-do list. So yeah, I put this in my planner as well. Um, because otherwise I get sidetracked. I'm like, oh, well, I could start doing this. And Margaret has a great example there of her to-do list. It just kind of keeps me in the mode of just being the most effective that I can with my time. Um, otherwise, like I said, I get distracted easily. I have ADD, so that's very easy. <laughs> and then take care of yourself. Go for a walk. Um, I actually had a really hard time transitioning um, when I started last fall because our classes were online um, like one week and then we'd be in person the next week and it would just keep alternating. And so I was spending most of my days inside on Zoom and not really getting outside and getting exercise. So I gained like 15 pounds and I've been trying to like walk more and do exercise. I now do CrossFit and I found that it really just allows myself to just get out of my mode of doing work and doing school. And it's just a really nice refresher, but you don't have to go for a walk. You could go to the gym, you could do painting. I got into diamond painting during the pandemic. And so <laughs> that's something I do uh, sometimes. And I just put the TV on the background and um, just kind of get out of my zone. So that's really nice. So what, whatever you um, like to do, like take a bath, whatever. Just take care of yourself. So we probably touched on this a little bit yesterday, but whenever your college degree you decide to go for, if you know you want to go to vet school, then go ahead and look at the prerequisite requirements for the vet school you'd like to go to, whether that be Texas A&M or one in your state or Oklahoma State. Um, and see if maybe the degree you're choosing at your undergraduate offers a good overlap with the prerequisites for vet school. Um, science-based courses are going to be the majority of that. So if, it'll be great if you if you love science because you'll be good to go. Um, but like it says here, please do take classes that are fun as well, like art, or if you want to get a business minor because you know you want to open your own veterinary practice. That makes you look interesting and like you found interests of your own on your vet school application. So don't forget to have fun. I know that preparing for vet school is intimidating and it's a lot of work, but you should still, you know, enjoy what you're doing. I second that, Margaret. Whatever you like to do, just do it. Because you don't want to also be stuck with a major that you don't really like if vet school ends up falling through. Um, like, if I had decided to just give up on applying to vet school and just wanted to try and do something with my biomedical sciences degree, I don't know that I would have personally been that happy with it, um, but that's just me. So like, if you wanted to do, you know, if you're a painter, you really like art, get a minor in art. Or, um, you could even major in art and then just have those prerequisites um, as um, like side courses. Um, it's like 50, 53 hours or something like that. Um, so it's like two years of college um, to get those prerequisites in. Um, and you don't have to actually have a bachelor's degree to get into vet school. Um, but in my opinion, it is good to have it as a backup. Um, just in case, like I said, if that school doesn't end up working out for you. So once I'm in vet school, what can I do to be successful? So like we were saying, use a study technique that helps you learn quickly. So for me, that was reading the chapter and then writing like an outline of it and then going to class, hearing it again and writing any notes. Um, to the side that I thought would complement whatever down well. 
um, but it could also be you learning in a group, um, writing things out on a whiteboard. I know a lot of people go up to the vet school and do that, um, and they'll just spend hours writing things over and over on the whiteboard. Personally, that doesn't work too well for me, but I also have a mini uh, whiteboard at my desk at home that I can write and draw things out if I need to. Form a study group. Yeah, find a study partner. Um, this was also very nice last semester because I wasn't getting um, that much interaction with other people due to COVID. Um, you really do start missing just interactions with people when you're not around that much. Um, so that was really hard for me, but um, with the study group and also being an out of state student, I didn't really know anybody. And so this was really nice because my anatomy group was like, hey, y'all wanna study together? And I was like, yes. Um, so I already had like three other friends that I could talk to and ask questions if I didn't understand something. So it, it also really helps just to have connections like that. Set aside time for self-care each day, I've seen earlier. Keep up with your interests. Um, I know like me, I really like to walk, um, but because of vet school at first, I wasn't able to walk. And so I was always feeling really pent up and um, I was stressed out more than usual. But then I got back to walking and a lot of that went away. So just keep up with your interests. Don't let them um, go to the wayside too much. And then create many goals. Um, this is kind of like our to-do list we were talking about. Um, just take it little chunks at a time because it is going to be a lot. Um, it will be overwhelming at first. Um, typically is for most people just because of the volume and how much you are studying. Then if you don't understand something, ask the professor. They have been in your shoes. Um, most of the time they'll be able to give you examples or be able to explain it in another way um, that you can understand. Um, typically they'll let you email them pretty late into the evening. Um, they just wanna be there for you as much as they can. So we are not moving on to anything, but um, do you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, anything? I know we touched on this a little bit yesterday. You're welcome, Grace. You're welcome. We love vet school, so we could <laughs> talk about it all day. You're welcome, Carla. Uh, I believe your name is pronounced Gina. Gina, yeah, I think my mom says I've been saying I wanted to be a vet since I was in fourth grade. So it's been a long time. And so I always knew that I wanted to work through and get to vet school. Um, but I also think that it's okay if you find out during undergrad that, you know, I really love science and I have always loved my farm animals. Maybe I could be a vet. Like, just cause you, if you haven't been wanted to do it forever that doesn't mean you don't belong in veterinary medicine. Oh, look at your perfect slide for that question. Nice. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I didn't realize what you were saying. Um, yeah, so that's all we have for today. Um, we will see you guys next Wednesday. We don't have class tomorrow. Um, next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Spoiler, we are going to be discussing bone cancer in large breed dogs. So get excited about that. Um, also, make sure you have completed the pretest and the first three sections um, of the cellular biology module. Um, so that's cell theory that we did yesterday, and then cell types and cell structures. 
that we did today. And if you're caught up in all of those and you just get to relax until we see each other next time. So we'll stick on here for a little longer. Um, if you guys have questions other than that, you're free to go. Hope you guys have a great weekend and have had a great time today. So thank you all for being here.